Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Tonight's podcast is brought to you by Nature Box. Order great tasting, healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine. You can get in shape for summer with healthy, delicious treats like everything bagel sticks. Support this radio podcast. You get 50% off. That's freaking half off your first order. Go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinking atheist from time to time we'll talk about what it's like to come out as an atheist what are the ramifications what's going to happen what are people mostly afraid of is it a positive thing is it a relief finally i got a chance to just say it to somebody and I like to cover the topic from time to time because we have a lot of new listeners coming in and people's experiences are so vast and so broad and so unique that I think we always have fresh things to talk about. You know, when I was starting the Thinking Atheist website, launched in spring of 2009 for the first almost two years, I was anonymous. I didn't show my face I think it took me at least a year, maybe a year and a half, to say my first name. I was just hiding behind the icon because I was still scrambling to pick up the pieces of my life. I thought, "Uh, what am I going to do here? You know, I'm driven to have these conversations. I'm driven to challenge my former faith. I know it's all a bunch of crap. But I am so deeply interwoven into church culture family, friends, career, all of these things, that I am terrified I'm going to lose my job. And in midlife, I'm thinking of mortgage and payments of this and that that have to be covered, a family to take care of. It's, you know, it was, it was scary in a lot of ways. It was scary to think that people that I had known for years, perhaps even decades, would walk away. And just say, no, this is, this is much too hot for me to handle. I really don't want to have anything to do with this new Seth. <laughs> we missed the old Seth. And uh, I talked about this in my book, and I speak about it from time to time when I'm out on the road. But the very first time I ever said atheist in relation to my name and face, The first time I publicly presented as an atheist was at a convention. It was at a conference, the first ever free thought event in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I really wanted to just come out with it. And that's what happened in the summer of 2011 at the Oklahoma free thought convention. And it was a gift. That day was a gift for me. I was standing on stage in front of 300 people who who totally got it you know, who totally seemed to understand what that day was about. And they just wrapped their arms around me and continue to. And, um, you know, there's just no turning back. And have there been ramifications? Well, you know, it's not like I live in Iran. (laughs) You know, I'm not looking over my shoulder waiting to be imprisoned. It's not that kind of thing. But there are some significant changes to my life because I no longer believe in God, and because I'm an atheist activist. You know, I'm not just a non-believer, I'm an activist. I'm out there on the front line shaking the bushes. I'm out there trying to, as Dr. Bogosian says, disabuse people of the faith virus. And um, I feel a temperature change in the conversations I have with friends and family who remain religious, protectively religious. And I'll tell you something interesting that happened once I came out. And I came out officially to my family in 2009 with a letter 
I wrote a letter and it explained basically what had happened in my life. I had looked at the God question with fresh eyes and come to a different conclusion than I had 30 years before, when I was so wise at the age of nine and even 19, 29. And something interesting happened with my family and friends. You know how many people came back and asked me questions? Nobody. You know how many people said, Seth, you're a pretty smart guy. I mean, wow, I'd sure like to know more about this journey you're on. I'd like to test my own belief system to see if there's anything I need to be evaluating. Maybe we can challenge each other to live truthful lives. You know how many people did that? Nobody. Nobody. In fact, of the huge sort of shotgun blast of this email, I sent it out to a ton of people, family and friends. I got one response back. One! From my parents. You're just preaching atheism. You've just traded one religion for another. Don't even get me started on that argument. For my part, despite some challenges coming out for me, it took a while, but I got there. Turned my life upside down in many ways in the best possible way. When I look at my life, I, I just wouldn't go back. There's just no way. People have said, if you could go back to sort of your happy, clappy, naive, religious life, would you ever go back? <laughs> oh, no way. No way. Not even close. Don't even have to think about it. I ain't going back. I came out atheist, which I borrowed, by the way, as... Uh, Greta Christina's new book, Coming Out Atheist, has just released. I begged for permission to sort of, of course, she was very cool, of uh, borrowing the show title. Her book is called Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It, How to Help Each Other, and Why. I had a chance to speak with her in Salt Lake City during the American Atheist National Convention, and we got part of that conversation recorded, and I'll play you some excerpts from that in just a few minutes. Had an email in from Matt. He said, My wife and I have appreciated your podcast a great deal during the past year, which has been a difficult trial of leaving the faith, which we both held for 35 years. Your podcast, entitled You're Not Alone and You're Not Crazy, was one of the first we listened to. And it met us both like a balm of sanity after so much turbulence in our personal relationships with friends. Two years ago, a few initially disquieting questions found their way to my door. As a research engineer, I wound up spending a solid year examining the foundations of Christianity. Casual reading became a critical research project, a pursuit of obsession and exhaustion. Most of what I'd read about our origins and the Bible were overturned. Everything that I read led to further problems and further questions, and it became clear that the traditional views of Judaism and Christianity did not stand on the firm footing I'd thought. I sought the counsel of the older and the wiser, and I was astonished at how meager the offered answers proved to be. I read everything that was handed to me. And as I've come to say, it was our own Christian scholars and no one else's that taught me to despair. I left the faith about a year ago, and I was surprised at the social dynamics. After having private cafe chats with my closest inner circle friends, I expected the news to spread organically and rapidly throughout our church community. It was too scandalous to stay quiet. To preempt misunderstandings, I posted a heartfelt autobiography on a blog that would allow concerned friends to understand better what my reasons and my sources were. Some of those one-on-one -on -one talks were very civil, even cordial. Others were more emotional. Some friends were truly afraid for us and saddened, as at the passing of a loved one. Yet, as most deconverts will attest, others showed great anger and hostility. I lost one of my closest friends in the ordeal that followed, and a 15-year relationship dissolved within a few weeks. But overall, I found myself astonished at one baffling outcome. Word didn't spread. It was as though my inner circle of friends each quietly decided to keep it to themselves. It wasn't until some weeks later that another friend finally did contact me, astonished and surprised at the news 
A few more intermittent contacts were made, and then a few months after my leaving, suddenly the news seemed to flash over the remainder of our friends. I tried to have patient discussions, either in person or by email, with anyone that wanted to talk. Though it became harder to understand the motive of some, who ultimately seemed interested only in hit-and-run, drive-by criticism. Some friends wrote me off rather early, and they chose instead to focus their attentions on my wife, who had not decided to leave the faith yet. People sent her condolence cards. They sent apologetics books. Often the husbands never contacted me, but the wives went to her. It was the oddest thing. One of the reasons I'd posted my story was to draw the fire, in a manner of speaking, and to spare her from having to answer for my change of views, but it didn't seem to matter. And my wife found herself squeezed in a difficult situation. But coming from our somewhat patriarchal denomination, I found myself disappointed at the overall lack of male presence. Something else about our faith, I suppose, that proved in the end to be mostly empty words. Nevertheless, we survived that turbulent season. My wife made her own decision in her own time, and we are now both happily godless together. We were honest with our children after a time, and I explained my views through some gentle and slow discussions with my 12-year-old son and 10-year-old daughter. However, we found to our relief that they proved far more resilient to the new situation than my wife and I had been. My son's response to the truth about Noah, I knew it. I just knew that couldn't have been real. Coming out had its surprises. In our case, the inner circle of friends proved in some ways to be the quietest, while second-tier friends were often more vocal. I think that posting an open letter in blog form did the job that I'd hoped, Though that had surprises, too, I didn't have to invade anyone's inbox with a letter, and many friends did read it. However, none posted comments on the blog, another odd silence, and none brought serious challenge to the disquieting facts I'd presented. Yet through the blog, I'd made a number of new friends who share and understand the struggle to get free from faith, a benefit I cherish and a blessing most unexpected. To encourage others, I can only say that, yes, we'll be shoved into shoe boxes and labeled whether the labels fit or not. Yes, people will say hurtful things, but I believe in the end that the scars from our exodus are outweighed by new muscle. I'm thankful for each day, and it does get easier with the passing of time. Beauty I have beheld through the veil of never-never, but it sings more clearly now. And the true story of our people and our pale blue dot reads more finely than all the mythology I've left behind. Life is beautiful and whole, even if fleeting, and quite unhaunted, it beckons. Thank you for all you do, Seth. You've helped catch us when we were in free fall. <laughs> Cheers and best regards. Matt, thank you so much for a beautiful letter. The silence when you come out to many people is interesting, isn't it? It's like, I think they fear genuine challenge, which is odd if you're talking about a hugely sound worldview. I would think if you had sort of an impenetrable fortress, you would want it tested at every turn. Yeah, bring it. Bring the arguments, bring the evidence, bring your scientists, bring your science, bring all that stuff. We're ready for you. We welcome it. We want it, you know. And instead, it's... We're right. Everybody just sort of disappears. It's an interesting phenomenon. It doesn't always happen that way, but it happens enough to warrant mention. Area code 704. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Black non theist I'm a first-time listener and I really appreciate your work. I'm very excited to be on the line with you. Thanks for calling the show. What do you have for us tonight as we talk about coming out atheist? Well, I have a completely different take on it. I think theists are the ones that should be coming out to us. I don't think that a person who isn't a theist has anything to apologize for or any reason to explain their wanting to be a normal, rational human being. I think the theist, the onus is on the theist to... to explain why they decided to 
believe in an ideology that would allow a person to mistake the voice in their own head for the voice of an all-powerful being. I think the onus is on the theist, not on the non-theist. But you're absolutely right. The burden of proof is on those making the claim. But in a hugely religious society, there are consequences to those who speak the words of rationality against superstitious thinking. Absolutely, I agree with that. But um, I think we need to turn this whole thing on its head because I keep hearing about people coming out and apologizing and apologizing for it. And I think that gives more power to the theists in their thought that we're doing something wrong. When Are you hearing apologies in, on your end? I mean, I'm hearing people talk about difficulty. Are you seeing people being too deferential out there when it comes to declaring their non-belief? Absolutely, absolutely. In the videos that I've watched, I've definitely heard, especially younger people when they're talking to their parents saying, you know, I'm sorry, Mom, but I just don't believe. Or I'm sorry, Dad, but I just don't believe. And I think the conversation should go, Mom, I'm waiting for your apology to me for making me a theist without my permission when I was younger, as was the case in my case. You know, I was brought up a Christian, and I was never asked if I wanted to be a Christian. You know, like many of us weren't. You know, we were just baptized and brought up that way. And instead of waiting until we could make the decision on our own, we were forced into theism. And I think that people who do that should apologize to their children. So I'm waiting for my apology from my family for forcing me into something without my permission. Well, you're not going to get an apology, but you're saying that it's a stand you take on principle. Is that the deal? Yes, yes. And and I don't I don't think like you said I will get an apology, but I think if anyone should be apologizing, it should be the person who forced the other to do something against their own will. How long did it take you to break out? Not long at all. It all started for me when I first got the iPhone <laughs> about uh, six, seven years ago. When I had that, the, the power of YouTube right in my hand, I went kind of crazy with it. I was on it all the time, and I watched a lot of videos about political corruption, and eventually that started to lead to religion. And the more that I watched and the more that I studied and the more that I researched on my own, the, the less that I believed. I always had doubts in the back of my mind when I was younger, but I never researched it. I had no idea where to go with those questions. You know, I would ask my mother, but the answers that she gave me weren't sufficient for me. So as I started to do my own research, you know, I definitely decided that I am not a theist anymore. So this was about seven years ago that I made that decision, but I haven't been too vocal about it besides with my brother, who I'm very close with, but I haven't told my mother about it at all. My mother is a minister, so... But you, you know, haven't called her very... up? Come on, you haven't called her up and said, you owe me an apology for raising me no, no. in a house of indoctrination, <laughs> because that's what you're pitching here. You know, That's what you're telling me we ought well, to be doing. Well, well, what I'm saying is, I'm, once when it comes up, I'm not going to apologize for the way that I am. And like I said, I just feel like if anybody should apo be apologizing, it would be the other way around. But I'm certainly not going to apologize. And I don't expect her to apologize because I know she was just doing what she thought was best. She was just doing her best to raise me the best way she knew how. So I don't expect her to apologize for that whatsoever. But I'm also not going to apologize for feeling the way that I feel. Good for and you. I love my mother. I definitely don't want to hurt her feelings. And I know it's going to be very difficult for her to understand why I don't believe in the things that she believes in. I started to make a few videos and put them on YouTube. And I'm kind of hoping that, you know, I can direct her there and she can get a full explanation for why I feel the way that I do. So that She must I be getting some hints, trouble. right? She's not stupid. Is she starting to feel that you're... You know, after seven years, she's got to catch a little bit of that on her radar. Does she see any of this coming? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure she has some inclination that I'm not as yeah. devout as she is. But we live in two separate states, so we're many miles away from each other. We don't see each other all that often, so I'm kind of able to do my own thing without her seeing. But like I said, I know it's going to come up at some point, and I'm going to have to be honest with her because I have to be myself. I don't like lying to my mother at all. And your tactic for coming out is going to be to direct her to sort of a short library of YouTube clips that you've done. Here, if you want to understand well, me, watch this video. Is that your sort of method for coming out? <laughs> well, you know what? I think I'm kind of using the videos as kind of exercise for myself to prepare myself for when not only my mother, but the rest of my family, you know, when I do end up talking to them about it. Part of me thinks that they might come across it without my knowing. 
maybe a friend of a friend might see it and, and direct them to it and they might see it that way. Well, I'm, look, but, hang on. Now, I'm uh, not saying that that's not a great way to do it or it's not the most appropriate way for you to do it. I mean, I'm just sort of testing the waters and asking if that's sort of a comfortable way for you. Because if I was a religious parent and I just happened upon my kid's atheist video, would I have rather had a one-on-one, person-to-person, adult-to-adult conversation about right. this kind of thing. I mean, they might feel a bit ambushed if all of a sudden they see, hey, whoa, what's going on here, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've thought about that, too. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just as tough as, I guess, anybody else trying to deal with it. But Well, I take I your larger I, point. I, I guess... When the time comes for you to say it, however you say it, whenever and wherever you say it, you will say so without apology. You're not going to apologize for... Right living your own life, right. living as an individual, and embracing rationality, science, and the evidence. Fair enough. Right. Thank you so much for the call and for being part of the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great all work, right. by the way. Thank you for all your work that you do. Very kind. Thank you so much. I think that'd be tough on a parent. I mean, I understand if you had articulated your reasons for walking away from superstition, and you'd planned it out in a way where it lent itself to a video or a piece of audio, a podcast, uh, even a blog, and you'd done it, you know, it, there might be some merit in saying, look, I like the way I said this the first time. I want you to watch this. Hear my words. See my words here. Listen to me and how I sort of frame this, and it will best explain how I got there. I think that's valid. But I also think, you know, if I was a parent cruising along and I just sort of stumbled upon it or somebody called me up, oh my God, you just I've got a YouTube video. You know, literally, everybody goes into panic mode. <laughs> you know, it's going to suck any way you do it for some people. But, it, you know, we need to make it suck less. Jessica sent a message and said, I was a very dedicated Christian up until about a year and a half ago. The majority of my friends are from private Christian college and the multiple churches I was a member of. My fears include losing friends, realizing my friendships are conditional. I'm scared my Christian friends will not accept me, not be able to look past my beliefs, and our relationship will turn into them feeling the need to save me or convert me back. I'm afraid of not being able to articulate my beliefs in a way that will make sense to them. I'm worried my friends will feel like they can't talk about God or their faith to me anymore, or assume I will try to argue them out of their beliefs. And I'm worried my friends will blame my agnostic atheist boyfriend. I was still Christian when we began dating. Some of my friends were not supportive of me dating someone who wasn't equally yoked. I've come out to my best friend of 23 years, who's a Christian. I was terrified. I sent her a message via Facebook, and she called me right away and said she didn't care what my beliefs were. She understood where I was coming from, and it doesn't change how she views me in the slightest. She'd actually thought something had changed with my beliefs because she noticed changes in my perspective on different things. She was saddened that I felt the need to hide it, and sad that I thought she would judge me for it. I felt this huge weight lifted off of me, and I was so happy to be able to be honest. Our friendship has only improved since then. Jessica, thanks for the message. I'm glad to hear that about your friend. It doesn't always work out that way. I've taken kind of a hard line about it in my own life for what it's worth, and this deals with friends and family. If someone requires agreement for us to be friends, they're not friends. They're really not. If we have to line up religiously, politically, or what have you to have the ability to enjoy and cultivate a friendship or a relationship together, we're not really friends. That's hugely conditional. You just want reinforcement. You're not going to be with me when the dark days come. And I found that those people bring so much negativity into my life that my life is actually better having excised them from my circle. And it's not always easy to do. Many times it is painful. Friends act like friends. Family acts like family. And just because somebody has a long history does not give them permission to inject negativity and condescension and just bad news into your life, into your family, into your mind and heart. No way. Friends act like friends. 
And so part of me wonders if those who fell away revealed what they were truly like, what they might be like when the shit hit the fan. And now perhaps you have more room to be able to embrace and accept genuine friends who will love and accept and support you for who you are. I certainly hope so. Before I get back to the switchboard, our show sponsor today is naturebox.com. Your mission is to snack smarter and get in shape by summer. Your enemy is the vending machine. Now, it's easy to talk tough about eating right. I'm going to eat right today. But when you're starving, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're cranky, you're lightheaded, you need something... Well, the vending machine is evil, and yet it's your only friend. Or so it seems. Don't give in. Keep your eye on looking and feeling great at pool parties. Head over to naturebox.com. They send great-tasting snacks right to your door. They're great for you, too. We're talking healthy, great-tasting snacks like PB&J granola pistachio power clusters, baked sweet potato fries, South Pacific plantain chips, and over a hundred more. And you get to choose, all with zero trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup, nothing, zippo, zero artificial. You'll even find snacks that are gluten conscious and non-GMO. It's a great idea. They just send the stuff right to your door. With free shipping anywhere in the U.S., it's busting up the vending machine's monopoly on your midday hunger. It is Nature Box. Try it right now. Get 50% off. That's half off your first box by going to naturebox.com forward slash thinking atheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. I had the opportunity in Salt Lake City, Utah, to talk to Greta Christina, an atheist blogger, speaker, and author. She is author of the book, Why Are You Atheists So Angry? 99 Things That Piss Off the Godless. And she has authored a brand new book called Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It, How to Help Each Other, and Why. Now, we had a chance to chat for just a few minutes. And I asked her a few questions, specifically starting with, do we really choose what we believe. I think that we don't choose what to believe, you know, in the sense that I can't choose to believe in unicorns. I can't choose to believe that I can walk through walls, but I could choose to investigate the question of can I walk through a wall or not? You know, is it reasonable to think that I can or not? And in the same way, I think that we, you know, people who have left religion, we haven't chosen to not believe, but we've chosen to ask the hard questions that lead us to not believe. And so what is the purpose of the book? I mean, what is the book designed to do? It's basically a guide for telling the people in our lives that we are non-believers. And that's atheist, agnostic, humanist, free thinker, whatever language we choose to use for that. Um, it's a guide to how to tell people uh, how to manage, you know, to how to deal with the possible responses that we're going to get, why coming out is even important. And it also talks about how we can support each other, you know, for those of us who are already pretty much out as non-believers, you know, because it's not like it's an either or thing. It's a spectrum. You know, you, it's not like you're either out or you're not out. It's like you're more out or less out. Uh, but those of us who are more out, how can we help other people to come out? You know, it's easy for some to say, ah, oh, just throw caution to the wind, man. You coward. Go out and just tell everybody you're an atheist. Quit tiptoeing around. Quit walking on eggshells. Quit deferring to everybody else. Just say it. And it's not always that easy, is it? No, it's definitely not that easy, especially for some people. And one of the things that was, uh, when I was researching this book, I read over 400 coming out stories in researching this book, as well as just that I don't even know how many stories I've just heard, you know, and talking with people at talks and conferences and so on. And the thing is, there's just a huge diversity of experience. There's such a range. And it is harder for some people than it is for others. And sometimes that's because of circumstances. You know, if coming out will it completely alienate their family, if it might mean losing their job, uh, if it might mean losing custody of their children, if they're obviously living in a theocracy, you know, and it could mean losing their freedom or their safety or their life. And also sometimes it's different just because we have different personalities. You know, some people are more confrontational. uh, Some people don't care as much about what other people think. And some people are more social and, you know, it matters more to them, you know, that they have the approval and or at least acceptance of people around them. So 
one of the main points I make in the book is that when we're supporting and encouraging non-believers to come out, it's really important that that not turn into pressure or guilt tripping or, you know, scolding people because they're not out. Because it is very difficult for some people and, you know, it's difficult for emotional reasons and it's difficult for practical reasons. And I think that we need to, to have empathy. Well, as far as the book, it's called Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It, How to Help Each Other, and Why. And I'll include the link in the description box of this video. How is the information laid out? I mean, what's the angle here? So the book is divided into three sections, first of all. There's a a section on why people should come out as atheists at all, making that case. You know, that talks about how coming out, generally speaking, makes our own lives better, how it helps other atheists. And that section actually has a whole chapter on should we even come out at all? You know, so there's some reasons not to and helping people make that decision. Uh, And then the second section of the book is, you know, the the, the meat of the book, the heart of it, and that's how to come out. And it's broken down into who we come out to, coming out to family, to friends, the workplace, and so on. And then there's chapters based on just who you are and what your circumstances are. Are you coming out if you're a parent? Are you coming out if you're a student? If you live in a conservative community, a progressive community, if you're in the military, and if you're living in theocracy, and so on. Boy, the theocracy chapter, that was a challenge to write. Um, and, And then there's some discussion of just sort of techniques for coming out. You know, there's a whole section of sort of the basics that, you know, the basic guidelines that seem to apply to everybody, even though coming out is very different for for everybody. And there's a discussion of whether we come out with what I call the no big deal method, uh, which is where you just kind of drop it into conversation when it comes up, or is it more appropriate to sort of sit the people in your life down and say, I have something very important to tell you. I do not believe in God. Um, You know, there's a chapter on should we get into arguments about religion and so on. Uh, and then there's a chapter on, uh, or section on how to support each other in coming out. And that talks about things like coming out ourselves, how that helps other people, and forming communities, and trying to make our movement more diverse, and so on. And, you know, and talks about how one of the best ways that we can support each other in coming out is to simply do it ourselves. That's the number one thing if we want to help other atheists come out. Is So many atheists have said, seeing other out atheists made it easier for me. So is there a, an angle that... Maybe we haven't discussed that we should cover as far as coming out as an atheist, something that uh, many people skip over. One thing I think we often miss when we talk about coming out as an atheist is how much fun it can be. You know, we tend to focus on the downside, you know, the, the, the sad stories, the hard stories. And that makes a certain amount of sense because, you know, we want to commiserate and vent with people who will understand and we want to problem solve. And that's important. I'm not saying we shouldn't tell those stories, but I think we should also tell the other stories. We should tell the fun stories, the stories that turned out well. You know, coming out and being out can be so much fun. It's so liberating, you know, to not have to worry about, oh, do, what are people going to know about me? And, you know, if, they, if these people find out, they might tell somebody else and then my life will be ruined. If you're already just out, you don't have to have that fear. And when we're out, we don't have to take in other people's negative opinions about us. You know, if we're in the closet and people are saying bigoted things about atheists and we're not saying anything, we kind of are just taking that in. Whereas if we're out of the closet and people are saying bigoted things, we're putting that bigotry right back out in them where it belongs. I mean, it doesn't belong anywhere, obviously, but we're putting it back into them. They have to take responsibility for it. And one of the things that really surprised me when I first started researching this book, again, I read hundreds of coming out stories researching this book, and I was expecting to find so many sad stories, you know, so many tragedies. And I did. I read some very sad stories and some some terrible stories. But it surprised me that those were the minority. Most people who come out Eventually, it turns out well. You know, eventually their families accept them. Eventually their friends accept them. Eventually things are fine at work. It often doesn't take as much time as we think it's going to. And overwhelmingly, atheists who have come out of the closet say that they're happy that they did it. You know, I again, I read hundreds of coming out stories for this book. Literally one person said that they regretted having done it. Everybody else said that they were, they were happier now that they were out. And that's true even if they lost their family, even if they did have to leave their community, even if they did have a very hard time doing it. They're still happier having done it. And 
and that's the, the number one message I think I want to convey with this book is absolutely be smart about it. Don't make a fool of yourself. Don't do it if it's going to be dangerous. Don't do it if it's going to make you lose your job. Don't do it if your parents are going to cut off your tuition or whatever. But if it's reasonably safe for you to do so, coming out is almost certainly going to make our lives better. The book is called Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It, How to Help Each Other, and Why, Greta Christina. And again, I'll link to that book in the description box of this show. I'm amazed at sort of the different tack people take when it comes to potentially losing family members over their apostasy. There are some I know who are genuinely traumatized by the idea of being shunned or having to draw very, very hard boundaries with family, a religious family who paw at them, who won't leave them alone, who condescend, who bring negativity into their lives. And they have to, they have to sort of draw that line in the sand and it rattles their cage so much. It traumatizes them. They're just, their heart is broken to the core over it. And there are other people who seem to be like, ah, whatever, you know, whatever. If you don't love me for who I am, then you don't deserve me. Bye. And they just take off. Maybe that has to do with personalities and temperaments. I don't really know. I don't really know. But, you know, with so many consequences out there, I had a uh, message in from Violet. She said, the one piece of advice I can give is to not do what I did. I came out to my parents in the middle of an argument with my father. I don't even remember exactly what it was we were arguing about. But at one point, Dad brought God into the situation, and out of anger, I just blurted out, I don't believe in God. The conversation took an immediate 180, and he spent the next hour lecturing me about Jesus while my mom stayed out of the way, crying as she cleaned the dishes. Really, guys, an already emotionally charged situation is not the time or place to come out to your family. I may have had to deal with it, but I hope that by sharing my experience, you won't make that same mistake. Something as huge as this should be handled with care and dignity, not with recklessness and rage. You know, she's got a great point. I mean, your disposition and demeanor is everything. And when you have that conversation, man, you need to be level and even and calm and poised and together. The last thing you need is to look like you're about to pop an O-ring in front of the people you're trying to convince, <laughs> you know, because the purpose of that discussion is not to convince them. The purpose of that particular discussion is not to change the minds of the people that you are coming out to. You are simply declaring your own position. Hey, this is what happened to me. This is my position, and I just want you to know about it from the source. And then don't allow yourself to get sucked into an argument. Not in that conversation. That's not what that conversation's about. Don't let them push your buttons. Don't let them get you worked up. Don't let them derail you. Stay on point. This is personal opinion. Stay on point. <laughs> Make your case. Keep your temper. And if they can't respect boundaries, call the conversation done and say, have a good night and have a good night. We'll see you later. You know, I wanted you to know from me, I just, this is a, a very real thing. And uh, if they start to flip out and can't deal, then you politely excuse yourself until they can approach the conversation more respectfully. The worst thing you can do is to have yourself completely teed up and just burst out. I don't believe in God. Then it's all about emotion. I mean, reason has gone out the window. Even if you're trying to argue a rational, reasonable point, if you were doing so at the peak of emotion, your race car is in the red, how do you come off? How do you appear? Are you at your best at that moment? Probably not. Area code 774. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. This is Andy from Massachusetts. I've got an interesting coming out story because it was an accident and... Uh... <laughs> I did a little bit of public affairs work when I was uh, in college, and I should have known better than to let it happen this way. Uh, I used to be part of, I spent 10 years in the church before I left, and uh, I was 23, growing a career, and I stopped going to church, and I stopped going to these church events and all these Bible studies that I was a part of with very senior assistant pastors and the like, and very uptight 
young men and I was always a questioner. I mean, I, I got in trouble at church for questioning. I'd question abortion. I'd question, you know, people, somebody would say, well, this is a Christian nation. And I would just, my face in the palm of my hands and somebody would say, what's the problem? And I'd go and I'd try to explain for the AAA and all this other stuff. And they just wouldn't even listen. So when I came out, I just stopped showing up and I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't do anything else. I just didn't show up anymore. And when I stopped showing up, people started calling me, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? And I could only stave off, I'm busy with work and stuff like that for so long before I finally had a heart to heart phone conversation with a, with a buddy of mine who, a uh, fellow veteran, uh, you know, I was Coast Guard, he was Navy, and, you know, somebody who I thought understood me and stuff like that. And the next thing I know, the next day, I get a phone call from said assistant pastor. And the number one tool that he used to try to get me back into the uh, church was fear. Well, hang on just a Uh, second. Now, you stopped going to church. You just checked out and said, I'm done. And they perceived that as a product of your atheism, or they thought you just were not interested in attending church. How'd they find out you were a non-believer? Well, at first they asked me where I was, and I just said, because I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to have that conversation. I was avoiding it. So why do you not want to tell the church that you're an atheist is what I want to know. You know what, the church? I just, I knew it was going to be drama, Seth. I knew it was going to be a problem, and I knew there were going to be consequences. I flat out just did not want to have to deal with that shit. And sure enough, the drama ensued, and... um, I mean, in the span of just after this pastor spoke to me and, I, and it got out, I mean, I, I, you know, it's shallow. It was only networking. I, I probably, out of the 200 some odd people who defriended me on Facebook, I probably only really spoke to about 30 of them. But I mean, we're talking about 200 some odd people just defriending me and me becoming the spawn of Satan. I was blacklisted. I found out that pastors have preached about me. I've been told that I'm ungrateful. I'm just angry at God, which, I mean, you have to actually believe that something exists to be able to be angry at it. What I will say is that now afterwards, after the dust settled, I mean, this is October, 2011, when it went down, the freedom that I have now is incredible. The consequences as sucky as they were, for the most part, have blown over. Coming out as an atheist is not for everybody, for sure, but I want to trade it for the world. I actually have the opportunity now to take the one life that I have, knowing that I turn to dust when I'm done at the end of my lifespan. And I have the opportunity to go and quite frankly, get shit done. And now when I watch some of these people who I know from these Christian circles, I mean, they are just wasting their time. Yeah. They're They're worshiping death, right? They're living to die. But when you realize that the clock is ticking, it really adds a greater urgency to every moment here on planet earth. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, and I'll tell you what, Seth. I look at it, and the real friends stuck by me. I have Christian friends who have stuck by me. Um, one or two of them have certainly started to question more as time has gone on. I was told that I was going to fail in life because God would take His wrath out on me. Hasn't happened yet. Not on what. <laughs> I think uh, I've heard some of the same stuff. You know, how can God ever bless you? How can you ever have blessings in your life? And I'm looking around and I'm looking at my beautiful family and I'm looking at a woman that I adore. And and I look at the fact that I've had some success in my life and I'm part of a movement that I love and I've made friends all over the the world. And I think uh, I would want to go back. Why? (laughs) I would want to give this up. Why? I would want to live a religious life again. Why? That's not a very strong case, my friends. I'm like you, man. I just never go back. Never want to go back there. I'll tell you right now, in 2012, I geared up with a nonprofit to go and respond. Volunteer time, took vacation time from work for Hurricane Sandy. And I watched on Facebook, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have to pray for the victims that are about to get hit. Or, and then afterwards, I'll, I'll, we have to pray for the victims. And uh, I got in trouble because I got a little bit snarky with some people who I just, because they were able-bodied folks who some of them weren't even employed. They could have gone and found a volunteer group to go down and do some work. I, I looked at them and was like, I'll tell you what, how about you just go and have happy thoughts over there? Get out of the fucking way while, my, while I drag my gear through so I can go and actually get this response going. Prayer is sort of the slacktivism of the church. You put your hands together, you say a few words, you pat yourself on the back for contributing, and then you go off and do whatever it is you were going to do anyway with no actual difference being made, which is 
quite tragic yeah, in most absolutely. cases. So I got to move on, my friend. Thanks for the call and thanks for being a part of the show. I appreciate you. Hey, thank you so much, Seth, for everything that you do. And, uh, you know, you just keep doing what you're doing, man. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Very kind. Take it easy. Had an email in from Lisa. She said, I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland, spent my first 24 years there. I grew up going to Sunday school on Sundays and watching documentaries every night with my dad. I loved science and I loved church. But even from the beginning, I had problems reconciling the two. Yet I never gave up either one. I compartmentalized like the best of them and compromised when I had to. Sure, a literal seven-day creation couldn't be true, but that was just a metaphor for God's hand in evolution, right? That sort of thing. When one church imploded on itself, I moved to another, and then another, until I'd gone from the cozy Methodist church of my childhood to a clapping, tongue-talking, dancing, Pentecostal church. All my friends and family knew I was really religious. At times, I was pushy, but not usually. I tended to take the stand that if anyone was interested in my religion, they could ask me, and sometimes they did. It wasn't until that Pentecostal church started to fall apart that I really began questioning my religious upbringing. I left the church and decided to let go of everything they told me and rebuild my beliefs on my own. I wanted to decide for myself what I believed without anyone telling me what those beliefs should be. I didn't really tell anyone I was doing this. In fact, I would drive off every Sunday dressed for church and go sit at a park until services would normally let out wasn't out of shame, but more out of the desire to have this be about discovering myself. I didn't want all the questions and the pressure. At about the same time, I was given the opportunity to move to Cincinnati. I jumped at the chance. It wasn't that I didn't like Maryland. I miss it dearly at times, but I saw it as a chance to step out of stagnation and start fresh, and that's just what I did. It was about nine months after my move that I whispered the word atheist quietly into an empty room, cringing and looking about for lightning. By the time I was settled into my own apartment with a new job, I was calling myself an atheist to anyone who asked. I also came out as bisexual. I have the same attitude about my atheism as I did about my religiosity. If you ask, I'll tell you. It's surprising how many people ask, due to genuine curiosity, and at this point I have friends and co-workers that send people to me with questions. Not everyone understands my beliefs, or lack thereof, but I find that the vast majority of the time people respect them. I imagine this is, at least in part, due to the fact that I accept everyone I meet as they are. I may try to correct them if they're blatantly wrong about something, but when I do, it's in a respectful way, more like... You should think about this, unless, wow, you are so wrong. I'm more one to help people question what they think is true than tell them what to think. Still, it's strange visiting Maryland and my family. Some of them know, some of them don't. I love it there, and I love them all very much, but visiting them makes me feel like I'm squeezing into a sweater that's several sizes too small. I've outgrown the beliefs that they knew me to have, but they think those beliefs still fit. Coming back to Ohio, where I'm accepted as not only an atheist, but also bisexual, is like a breath of fresh air. This is where I made my stand. This is where I put myself out there, thinking no matter what, I was going to be me. And those that didn't like me didn't have to spend time with me. And strangely, this is where I found the most acceptance. I was willing to fight, but I found I didn't have to. I'm not saying that there isn't work to be done on the acceptance of non-belief. Of course there is. But I think that the majority of it will be won in this way, by coming out to those you trust and showing them that you're still a decent human being. Because even now, four years later, I'm still coming out of multiple closets and I still get the response, but you're so nice. The church builds us up to be nasty, teeth-gnashing monsters. It's up to us to show the believers that that isn't usually the case, in our own time, in our own way. And even with all that, this might help our cause. I didn't do it for that. I did it for me, my own freedom, my own peace of mind. 
One last call, area code 760. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Uh, hi, Seth. This is um, Alex. Alex, thanks for calling. What do you have for us tonight as we talk about coming out atheist? Well, um, I want to tell you before I start um, that I'm a high school 15-year-old sophomore. And um, when I first came out, I mean, when I first started to lean into atheism, I was around the summer of 2012. But I didn't come out as an atheist until mid-school year. I discovered a friend who was also an atheist, and he, he helped me through the, um, through this ordeal that I was having. And it really helps to have other friends who are atheists that um, can help you. I think he's the only one that I have as that's an atheist. And um, later I told my mom about it. She didn't freak out or anything. I think my, my dad's the one that got most reaction. And um, it was fine. My parents understood it. Your parents think you're going through a phase? They think this is, oh, he's a teenager. He's going to go through lots of these different types of things before he becomes an adult. Are you catching some of that right now? Yeah, I, I believe them. They used to think that, but um, now it's been a while. So uh, I think they're taking me a bit more seriously now than they used to. Because I am downright militant with the atheism. I mean, I'm not really like spreading the message out there, but I, I try. But I'm not as religious about atheism as some are. <laughs> are I you suppose. in a religious town or neighborhood or culture? I mean, your schoolmates, they know about it. And what's the reaction? I wouldn't exactly call it a, a, a religious town. It's a border town between Mexico and the United States over here in the California Imperial Valley. And... uh it's mostly Catholics, so it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, well, I think so. So, you know. Well, mo it's mostly all right. it's, I think yeah, Sunday church and bingo and beer and everybody. Yeah, I mean, I get that. It's more of a cultural thing than a fervent, hardcore, seven-day-a-week belief system. Would that be an accurate way to say it? Yeah, it's very liberal. Well, you encourage me. I look back when I was 15, man. I was 15. I was a, I was a minnow. A clean-cut, Bible-toting child standing, already standing on stages as a representative for Youth for Christ, imparting my wisdom to the masses. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? I look back when I was 15 and I think, God, you're so much further ahead than I ever was. You have such a head start on me and people like me. I kind of envy you. And uh, I'm encouraged by you and your story. It's great to see rationalism really spiking in this generation. You know, the Internet... And so many other factors have sort of all come together for a perfect storm of, of rationalism in this crazy world. I think your generation is going to be a game changer out there. So thanks for everything you're doing and keep yeah. doing it, okay? Seth, thank you for having me. All right. Take care of yourself. And a final email from Karina who said this, I am an atheist. This is one of the sweetest statements I can ever say. And I always enjoy the chance to say and savor that admission. I was raised in quite a religious family. My father was a Lutheran deacon, sometimes giving sermons when the pastor was away, and often went to share communion with those who couldn't travel. My mother is a member of the Altar Guild, which I was surprised to learn is quite an exclusive group of women trained in how the altar and the church must be set up for each event on the Christian calendar. Growing up with such parents, my brothers and I were sent to the private school associated with the church. We attended Bible camp and Sunday school. After confirmation at the ripe old age of 13, I became a Sunday school teacher for the youngest kids, which really means I let the little ones run around and make crafts while we sang catchy Bible-based songs. Or I read them the G-rated versions of the typical Bible stories. Even with all this religious indoctrination growing up, my parents valued education and constantly pushed me and my three brothers to always ask questions and to be skeptical about everything. Looking back, it seems that this skepticism was introduced not for the abstract purpose to simply question the world we live in, but as a result of my parents' paranoia due to my father's occupation. He was a police officer. In any case, the result was that I was the first, but not the last of my parents' four children, to come out as an atheist. As I grew up and began taking more science classes, 
I became very interested in biology during college. As a result, I often questioned my upbringing and talked extensively with my father. He had training in theology and was interested in science. I was being trained in science and was, and am, fascinated with theology. Our conversations had the most amazing ebb and flow, where we would often begin a discussion with him supporting religion, me science, and continue while our positions switched over and over in the debate. We often ended together agreeing on few good points of religion and better points from science, depending on the topic. I cherish those conversations, which had such an impact on my questioning religion, in a safe place, allowing me to think. My dad passed away before I officially came out as an atheist. I'm sure he knew, but I often missed the conversation we never had, following the declaration of my lack of belief. My parents' educational encouragement eventually led me to where I am now, a doctoral student studying biology in the Ecology Evolution sub-program. Although my mother is still very religious, attending church weekly, she is accepting of the beliefs, or lack of, of all of her children. At this point, I think she clings to the church more for community and support than actual belief. She hates that I am so vocal and she will often get frustrated with me if I push too much. But she does listen and doesn't simply dismiss what I say. I think she's starting to realize that we have become our own people, because she and our father taught us the most important lesson. Ask questions always. Always. Karina, thank you so much for the message. Now that the show's over, remember to go to naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist and order great tasting healthy snacks at 50% off. Forget the vending machine, get in shape for summer with healthy, delicious treats like barbecue kettle kernels. You can support this show, get half off your first order. Naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. Naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. Next week's show, we're talking about faith healer fails. How many people have been dragged in front of a faith healer? A conduit of God's miraculous healing power and they weren't healed. You don't hear about them in church. We'll hear about them next week on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. I'll see you then. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com